Welcome to week three of the What If series, where we want to start conversations for a better world based on the Ten Commandments. The third commandment says we must not misuse God's name. Some Bible translations say, don't take the Lord's name in vain. The idea is that people who claim to be God's children, namely Christians, should not misrepresent him to the world. We're here in downtown Chicago asking people what they think about Christians. And we're asking this question. When I say the word Christian, what comes to mind? Um, someone that is religious. <laughs> um, my mom's side of the family, I guess. I mean, I was bar mitzvah, and, uh, I'm Jewish. I'm a Muslim, by the way. Okay. So you're, uh, you're uh, asking a question for somebody that he may be biased to the subject, or he may have some uh, perspective. When I say the word Christian, what comes to mind? Lions. Say again? Lions. Um, hypocrite. I hate this, I hate that. You shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. I just think of people who like strongly believe in something. Definitely Jesus. I think of Jesus Christ. I think of me. Uh, me. Blessed and highly favored. Good people. Well, good morning and uh, happy Sunday. Welcome to uh, the last weekend in September and big baseball and all that stuff. Special greetings to those joining us at uh, Crossroads Highland Park upstairs at the 01. So 20 some years ago, uh, Austin, our oldest son, was about six, and he posted rules on his door. And uh, it was not exactly the Ten Commandments, there were 18 of them, and they were not sort of universal in their uh, direction. They were, they were focused pretty exclusively on one person, his, uh, uh, Ben, his, son, his brother, who's a couple years younger than him. We have a picture here, I think. Yeah, they look like they're so, you know, easy going, but uh, there were these rules that Austin listed. And uh, the first rule was, obey me, uh, o, <laughs> O-B-A-Y, obey me. The second rule was, if I come up with any more rules, obey them. The third rule was, no spitting. And the fourth was, don't hurt Feisty, the cat. The, then there was, uh, no, don't call names, uh, don't say bad words, and it sort of went down this, uh, don't throw anything unless I let you, and so there was, there was a, a handful of things that you, you could sort of figure out what was going on. I, I kept this, I actually have a photocopy of it framed in my office. And you can tell a lot about um, the rule giver by looking at the rules. And I think that's true with the Ten Commandments. And so we started and I said, look, this is not the rules of a bigger brother who's trying to protect his stuff. Uh, God has very lovingly and graciously given us insight into how life works. And uh, he, he is for us. He wants us to thrive. This is the way the universe ultimately unfolds. We don't break the Ten Commandments. We are broken by violating the, the, the essence of, of God's character. And so he has lovingly given us these Ten Commandments. And the first commandment is that we need God to be God. We all have a God. Uh, this God is going to shape us. We may or may not know who this God is. And so it's imperative that we bring our understanding of God, who God is, to who God actually is, right? We need to make the God our God. And then uh, last week we looked at how we worship, and we need, to, we need to let God be who he is. We don't get to change him. We don't get to shape him. He is God, and he... He is in charge. So the third commandment is what we're going to look at today. And as you've heard, next week, the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath rest commandment, uh, we're looking for you to invite others into conversations. There's a whole lot being written right now in the marketplace, in secular media, psychology studies about the pace of life and the importance of rest and all this. And so it's a, it's a fascinating topic. Today, we're looking at the last of the commandments that is exclusively focused on our relationship with God. Uh, the fourth commandment is also part of the, the, the first tablet, but the fourth and fifth commandments are sort of, sort of transitionary commandments. They go both ways. Uh, the third commandment, which is the, 
the third commandment that is a negative, and, and then we'll get a couple positives, and then commandments six through 10 are also gonna be stated in the thou shalt not uh, realm. Uh, but I, I've said this is, this is a good thing, actually. Remember, if, if, it's, if we're told what we can't do, that leaves a whole lot of room of what we can do. It's much more limiting to be told what we're supposed to be doing. That's a little bit more focusing. So I also said there's a grand positive behind all the negatives. And uh, we are going to see the grand positive today is that we can live a life that matters. And we can live a life that matters to God. And that's what we want to do. So, the third commandment uh, found in Exodus 20 and also in Deuteronomy is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He will not hold those guiltless who take his name in vain or misuse his name. So many people think that what this commandment means is that we shouldn't swear. Right? So don't, don't use God's name uh, as, a, as, a, as a curse word. Don't ask God to damn this or damn that. Don't type OMG on your texts, right? That God's name is holy and we shouldn't use it in that casual way. Okay, yeah, sort of, kinda, I guess so. Uh, I, I think it's a bad idea to, to, to use God's name flippantly. And so I would say, sure. Uh, and there's lots of good reasons to be careful with our speech. James tells us that the, the tongue is a mighty weapon and it can start fires and we need to be careful of our words. And Jesus tells us that we're accountable for the words that we say. It's clear when you read all the things that are written about our speech that God takes what we say more seriously than we might. And so, uh, yes, we need to be careful. Ironically, people who use the name of God in vain are implying some sense of power to that name because there's not a lot of names that work. You know, if you hit your thumb with a hammer, it doesn't work to say Churchill or Napoleon or something like that. Uh, there's power in that name. We need to reverence that name. There's a lot of other reasons, a lot of other passages that tell us to be careful with what we say. But the fact of the matter is, that's not the heart of this commandment. The third commandment is much bigger than that, and it, we have to understand two key words to, to really unpack it. The first word is, is name. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So I have, over the 20 years I've been here, talked about the importance of names with some frequency. I've noted that today, we're a little bit more casual with naming. We pick names that we like. We like how it sounds, or we like somebody that has that name. Uh, not uncommon to get a book of names when, uh, when you're about to have a kid and you look through the names. We had a book, and I remember you start, and it's Adam, and you go through, and then you get to, you know, Zowie, and you go, okay, didn't, didn't come up, go, go back to Adam and start again. You're trying to find a name you can both agree on. Uh, even in this culture, we are aware that names are important. So my uh, famous story is when I, after I graduated uh, from Trinity, I went down to Georgia before we got married, and I got a job working on a construction crew because there was an opening because Bo Gator had quit. And I never met Bo Gator, but I felt like I knew him. And uh, with a name like Bo Gator and hearing that he was gonna go ride his motorcycle, you sort of had a image of who Bo Gator was. By the way, <clears throat> Bo named his son uh, Little Bo Gator. Apparently the, the birth certificate said his full name was Little Bo Gator Harley Davidson, French. And uh, so given that, I felt like there are, there are things I knew about Bo. At the same time that I was hearing about Bo, I remember uh, I was reading a, uh, an article in the newspaper about the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain whose name was uh, Winston Lord. And I remember thinking, well, if your parents name you Winston Lord, there's only a few jobs you could get when you grow up. And if I was going to say to you uh, two 
two guys. One of them is riding in a motorcycle gang in South Georgia, and one of them is ambassador of the United States. And the two names that you're picking are Winston Lord and Bo Gator. It wouldn't be hard for you to say, I know who's got what job. Names have some significance. And then we see this in a variety of other ways because there are, for instance, uh, laws protecting names. So there are slander laws preventing someone from besmirching our name. Or there's forgery laws preventing someone from signing our name to something. And, uh, and then there's just sort of the, the observation that is timeless that when kids are disagreeing, one kid has locked another kid out of the room, for instance. That the, the, the kid that's outside that's pounding on the door to get in, saying, let me in, let me in. If he's, if he's going to move to the trump card, let me in. Mom says you have to let me in, right? Uh, I'm going to tell dad if you don't let me in. There's this appeal to a relationship with an authority. And the suggestion is, my will and the will of that authority are in sync, and so you have to do what I want because I'm coming in their name. So all that's in place today. When we back up and look at this biblically, it actually is, is far more weight given to names. So we see, for starters, that, that in, in biblical times, names generally had a meaning. So Adam meant human being, and Eve meant life-bearing, and Ruth was companion, and Abraham was father of nations. That's what these words meant. And so people have these names because that's who they are. And if they change, if they have an interaction with God which redirects their life, or if their character changes, their name is often changed. So Abram, after he gives, after Sarah gives birth to Isaac, is called now Abraham, the father of nations. And uh, Jacob, after he wrestles with God, has his name changed to Israel. And Simon, after he identifies Jesus, you are the Messiah, right? You are, you are the one we've been waiting for. After he says that, then Jesus changes his name to Peter. So change your character, change your conduct, your name is changed. And then there are other things that are worth noting. The word name in the Greek is not only translated name. In some parts of the New Testament, in some contexts, it's translated reputation, or it's translated character, or it's translated authority, <laughs> because name means all these things as well. Well, um, in addition to that, there's a, there's a couple things where we begin to understand and appreciate the gravitas that is given to this concept of name. Throughout the New Testament, we have statements that we hear so many times we might actually stop hearing that they're a little bit of an odd turn of a phrase. But we're told by Jesus that we are to baptize people into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're instructed to pray in the name of Jesus. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are, we are asking God, hollow your name, honor your name. And, and then in John, he gives eternal life to as many who believe in the name of Jesus. And then we have everything that surrounds the name of God. So Exodus chapter 3 is where, um, is where God calls Moses and Moses doesn't want to go, and you know, he's out in the, it's the burning bush. It's that passage. God was calling Moses to go free the people from slavery. And Moses doesn't want to go. And then eventually he agrees that he's going to go, and he says, you know, as he's got his commissioning, okay, so when I go back to the people, to the slaves, to the Jews who are in Egypt, and I tell them that you sent me, they're going to want to know, what is this God's name? Right? And it's not a question of what is he called. The question ultimately is, who is this God? What is he like? What's his character? Right? Who is God? And God very specifically, when, when he asks this question, uh, Moses asks this question, it's very specific that God says, here is my name. 
Naming implies power. And God says, I am, I am the self-naming one. <laughs> Nobody names me. I have named myself. And my name, and then he gives, for the first time in the Bible, we get not a title, because that's what has been used all through Genesis and Exodus up to this point, different titles for God. He doesn't get a title. He gets his covenant name, his actual name. And it is the word Yahweh, and it, it, it's an odd Hebrew construct, and there's all kinds of things that are unique about it. But, but in the essence, what it, what it means is, I am who I am. I will be who I will be, not who you make me. I am God, you are not. I'm in charge, you will follow. I am God. And again, there's so much that goes into this, the way the Jews tried to protect this name, the, the way that Jesus will later refer to this name when he's, when he's getting grilled by the Pharisees and he makes this claim about, uh, you know, knowing Abraham and they go, hi, you didn't know Abraham. Abraham has been dead all these years. And he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am, right? And they go, oh my goodness, he's, he's making these, these claims. He's claiming the, the covenant sacred name of God. So, we have uh, all these different things that suggest that the name of God is far more than just the word that is used to refer to him. It, it, it defines character, reputation. It is, it is the essence. It is a defining kind of aspect to God. So that's the first word. The second word we have to understand in order to appreciate this, this commandment is the word in vain or to misuse. And it's the Hebrew word schwa, and it means, in essence, don't, don't diminish, don't hollow, don't, don't pull down in any way the name of God. So what we're being coached is that our lives are, are, are not to diminish the reputation, the character, the honor of God. We should not do anything that is going to take God's name in vain. Take his character, his reputation, and, and pull it down. Hollow it of its, of its glory and its majesty. So, in order, to, in order to, to best understand all that's going on there, I want to jump ahead. Each week we've been starting in the Old Testament in Exodus, and then we go to a New Testament passage that sort of add some context and a New Testament update to the Old Testament commandment. So I want to go to Matthew chapter 7, uh, which is in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, verse 21 through 23. This is a uh, scary passage, perhaps one of the scariest passages in all of Scripture. So this is Jesus speaking, and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So, scary passage. I think it helps us understand what's going on with this third commandment. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So part of the reason it's scary is because the repetition of the word Lord is emphasizing that the person saying it feels uh, a strong sense of belief and connection to God. In the Semitic culture, you repeat a word in order to um, sort of double down on it. Jesus does this several times. Truly, truly, I say unto you. Or uh, at one point he says, Mary, Mary. Right? And, and there's, there's sort of not the kind of adverbs and adjectives that we have. And, and this can be a little confusing because there are passages in Scripture where if you get a bunch of translations out and you're just reading them, you're trying to figure out exactly what's going on, um, everybody's going in a different direction. In Genesis, there's this passage where there's a battle and a bunch of kings are falling into pits. And some say they're deep pits, and some say they're big pits, and some say they're tar pits, and some say they, you know, they have all these different things. You go to the Hebrew, 
the Hebrew says they fell into a pity pit. Okay, so they just repeated the word. There, there are pits, and then there are pits, right? So whatever the quality of a pit is, we're doubling it. So take the word Lord. So it means master, uh, and yet it, it's also there's a sense in which to repeat it like you repeat the name Mary, there's a sense of intimacy there. And so this person is saying, Lord, Lord, right? You're my master. Like, we're tight. Remember me? We're tight. We're connected. Lord, Lord. Uh, but Jesus says, not all of them will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This will be important. I'm going to come back to it in a second. Many, so this is not an uncommon occurrence, many will say to me on that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not preach, teach in your name, lead Lighthouse in your name? Did we, were we not involved leading a small group? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? And Jesus will tell them, Plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So the scary part of this passage is in, is in part that, that it suggests that there is orthodox theology in place, right? They're calling Jesus Lord. Okay, good. You've got that Jesus is Lord and Savior. There's some emotional engagement. They repeat the word. There's a sense of intimacy, connection, consider an exclamation point behind it. So there's some passion there. And then thirdly, there is uh, the suggestion of Christian service. Oh, we were prophesying, we were preaching, we were doing all, we were performing miracles. And yet Jesus says, well, no, we actually, I, I don't know you. And the implication is, Twofold, when you, when you dig in here to this and you look at the third commandment, the implication in part is you were doing your will, not mine. So maybe this describes you. You're, you're doing your will, not God's. So this is... Uh, this is scary also because our culture elevates our opinion. It's sort of what it means to be in the 21st century. There isn't truth, there's my truth. Right. We, we sit in judgment of all things because it's the individual that is, that is the all-important one, the all-knowing one. Um, I ran across, uh, went back and found this quote by, uh, by Ted Koppel, the, the newsman, back in the 80s, sort of during the highlight of uh, high time of, of Nightline. Koppel gave a commencement address at Duke University. And uh, he said this in his commencement address. We have convinced ourselves that slogans will save us. Shoot up if you must, but use a clean needle. Enjoy sex whenever and with whomever you wish, but wear a condom. No, the answer is no. Not because it isn't cool or smart or because you might end up in jail or in an AIDS ward, but no, because it's wrong. Because we have spent 5,000 years as a race of rational human beings trying to drag ourselves out of the primeval slime by searching for truth and moral absolutes. In its purest form, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulder. It's a howling reproach. What Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were not the 10 suggestions. So we tend to think that there are these suggestions from God. We'll call them commandments. But I sort of know best for me whether I'm going to apply these commandments or not. Right? And that, that, is, that is in the water we drink today. As a matter of fact, I don't believe Koppel would, would make this same commencement address today because while it sounds good, I don't know whether he would still hold to it and it would be radically unpopular, unthinkable at the university to suggest that there are absolutes. There's no absolutes except 
I get to decide what is right for me. I get to define myself. I'm in charge. It's my will that matters. This is so driven into who we are right now that we have crazy Orwellian doublespeak going on in which we, people are going back to, to take the heroes and to have them say the exact opposite of what they said. Remember in uh, Animal Farm, uh, the pigs spend all this time initially training the, the sheep who are not very bright to say, uh, four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad, right? Because they're overthrowing the farmer and, and so people that walk on two legs are not good. Four legs good, two legs bad. And then at the end, after they decide that they are gonna, the pigs decide they're gonna take over and live in the farmer's house and they're gonna walk on two legs and they're gonna act like the farmer, they, they take the sheep out and they train them to say four legs bad, two legs better, right? And, and so they take the, the statement and they completely flip it. That's what I thought of when I read this statement uh, in a magazine uh, attributing Martin Luther King to something Martin Luther King would never have said. So uh, this was in one of these uh, advertisements that looks like an article until you really look at it carefully and you go, no, this is an ad. Somebody paid for this. And it said, um, Dr. Martin Luther King taught us to be guided by faith in America's people and their social conscience. He taught us that the highest principle of justice the highest principles of justice are not found outside, but are found in ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely wrong, right? In Letters from a Birmingham Jail, what Dr. Martin Luther King said was, there are laws that are unjust. You think they're just. You're mad at us because we have violated these laws. You say they're good laws. You look in your heart and you say, this is the law that ought to be. No, he said. The question of whether or not a law is a just law or an unjust law is what does God say about it? How does it line up with what we find in Scripture? That is what Dr. King said in Letter to a Birmingham Jail. And yet what we've got is we need to look inside ourselves. We need to look inside ourselves to figure this out. No, that is the spirit of the age, but that is following our own will, not the will of God. And what what we're getting out of Matthew 7, and what I would argue is if we're trying to figure out what it looks like to live a life that is taking God's name as it should be taken, it means if I'm going to identify with God, with Christ, take his name, right, then it's his will, not my will, that matters. I'm saying I have a king, and I'm going to follow the rules of the king, and I'm not the one that gets to pick. <clears throat> There's one other thing. As I said, there, there are two things that sort of are in play here. And the second thing is that um, Jesus clearly implies that there needs to be a relationship. And this relationship comes in a certain way. And that way is through the work of Jesus Christ. Right? We become a Christian not because we meet a certain moral standard. <laughs> we become a Christian when we realize we cannot read a, reach a certain moral standard. And we need the work of Christ applied to our account. This is very different. We are saved by grace. We are adopted into the family of God. Like an infant that is adopted, we don't earn it. It's something that is done to us. So, why do you think we insist on earning? Most people try hard to get the job or to get the grade or to get into the grad school or to get whatever it is, right? To get the promotion, to get the... There's, there's a sense in which we want to perform at a certain level. Why? Like, what is it that drives us to be so determined to be our own Savior? Right? Well, I would say it's, at one level, it's that we're broken. 
This gets complicated because I do think we are called to live lives in which we're good stewards of the gifts and abilities that we're given, and there's a sense in which we want to do our best and we want to serve, and yeah, okay, there's, there's reasons why all that can make sense. But it's so easy to fall into this pattern where we are trying to justify ourselves to ourselves because we are remaining our Savior, right? I need to prove my worth, if only to myself. And, and I think that, that in order to be moving forward, in order to live a life that is actually taking God's name seriously, right? On the one hand, we're saying, okay, you're the king and following your will, not mine. And on the other, there is this ongoing realization that everything I'm doing to try and follow that will, I'm doing out of thankfulness for the free gift that Christ has given me by dying in my place, right? And I am, I am not earning, I am not earning, I'm not earning, and, and I, get a, I get a relax, and I celebrate the fact that Christ has done this for me. When we're doing something good, we're compelled either to give thanks for what has been done to us, or we're compelled by earning. And there's a whole lot of earning effort that goes on out there. And it is antithetical to the third commandment. So I ran across to prayer this week, and um, in my Friday updates, I've been sending out prayers mostly from you know, second, third, fourth century, middle ages, prayers that are hundreds of years old. And uh, this one is not. This one is, I suspect, two years old. But I thought it was, it was, it was absolutely spot on for the, for the third commandment and the point that I'm trying to make. And the question that the author asked was, have you ever prayed a prayer like this? And the prayer was, Lord, my intellectual faith is incomplete. My emotional love for you is cold. My best deeds are rooted in selfishness. But I ask, because of what Jesus did for me, dying my death and living the life I should have lived, that you would accept me. Let his righteousness be mine. That's what it means to become a Christ follower, right? That's the transition. I'm not, I can't do this. I don't need a little help. I need all the help. This isn't about, this isn't about God sort of filling in my shortfall. This is, this is all my, my intellectual efforts, my best efforts, my understanding, all of that falls short. If I'm gonna live a life that brings glory to God, which is the grand positive behind the third commandment, I get to live a life that matters, I get to live a life that is, that is pointing people to God, that is, that is exalting God. It's not because I'm so good, it's because it points to a savior and it shows what it looks like to live a life that is in submission to him. So as we end, I'm gonna pray this prayer again. Perhaps it's a prayer that you want to silently pray for yourself and then I will pray for the rest of us as well. Bow with me. Perhaps this is the day that you need to clearly articulate exactly this appeal. Lord, my intellectual faith is incomplete. My emotional love for you is cold. My best deeds are rooted in selfishness. But I ask, because of what Jesus did for me, dying my death and living the life I should have lived, that you would accept me. Let his righteousness accrue to me. Heavenly Father, help us to follow the third commandment. Help us not to take your name in vain. Help us to understand that you are the king and that we live in your kingdom and that we need to defer to the rules that you have set up. They're not oppressive rules. They're not a big brother trying to muscle uh, a younger brother. They're, they're rules for our good. They're rules that come out of your character. Help us to understand that we need to follow Christ's example, die to self, and, and pick up our cross and head down that path. So I pray for myself as I pray for others that we would see that. And I pray additionally, in addition to seeking your will in my life, I pray, Lord God, that we could, we could rest in the grace of Christ. 
and that the good that we do and the efforts that we expend would be extended would be expended out of a heart of thankfulness, not out of a, not out of a desperate need to try and prove ourselves to you or to someone else or to ourselves. So help us follow the third commandment, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.